you all for uh, for uh, um, gathering to hear about my work. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, um, about what we do. Our laboratory studies the um, he studies the neural dynamics of, of, of um, cognition, network dynamics of cognition, using multiple electrode recordings in monkeys performing cognitive demanding tasks, things like working memory, decision making, attention tasks, categorization tasks. And our data, being neurophysiologists, is the spiking activity of individual neurons, the voices of individuals in the brain, if you will, and local field potentials are the average activity um, near the recording electrode or the roar of the local crowd. And because today we'll be focusing on network dynamics, I'll mainly be talking about local field potentials where we can really average activity and look at the how net, um, um, neurons in different recording locations in, in the brain, different places in the brain can um, um, inter interact. So, um, the main focus of our lab's work has been top-down or executive control over the years. We've, we've studied this in, in a number of different ways, but today's topic, I'm gonna to focus somewhat on, on working memory, our mental sketch pad. And we all know what working memory is. It's the contents of our consciousness is what we use to hold, hold things in mind and manipulate them. Um, but let's remind ourselves some, something that's um, often sometimes lost, at least among um, uh, the, the neuroscience field is that working memory is not just short-term memory. Volition is what makes working memory special, something Pat Goldman or Keisha you'd like to point out. We have top-down control of our working memory, top-down control of our thoughts and actions so we can direct them towards goals. And this top-down control of, be, of thought and action is a major function of the prefrontal cortex. And one of the prefrontal cortex's main functions is to absorb goal-related or top-down information, then use it to exert control over, over cortex. Um, and how prefrontal cortex might do that is, um, is um, detailed in this, uh, in this article with a paper with uh, John Cohn and I wrote a number of years ago. But so first I'm just going to just give you a brief overview of, of some um, some older work, and then we'll go into more detail and in, in more recent work in lab, including some um, recently published work, and if I have time, some um, 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 too soon to be published work. So about 20 years ago or so, we started a series of investigations to study the, the role of the prefrontal cortex in acquiring top-down information. If the, if the prefrontal cortex truly is the brain is executive, it should have this ability to acquire goal-related top-down information, um, something that hadn't been studied up, up until that point. So in one series of investigations, uh, Dave Freeman, Max Reason, Hubert, and cl also collaboration with Tommy Poggio and Jefferson and Roy in the lab is they train monkeys to categorize shapes into two different categories. And in this particular experiment, there was, we had, they, they, they categorized a set of computer generated images as cats and dogs. These were three prototype cats and three prototype dogs. And we morphed or blended between the different prototypes. So there was all these stimuli along these morph lines, the smoothly varying shape space. But what we did is we, we, we devised a, we, we defined a, a sharp boundary um, in, in one set of experiments, it was exactly the 50-50 line in this, in this, in this shape space anything, and taught the animals that anything more than 50% cat was by definition a cat, anything more than 50% dog was by definition a dog. So what we did is we imposed, behaviorally imposed, uh, a sharp boundary where there wasn't one in the real world. And we could draw that boundary anywhere and we got the, got the same effects. And what those effects were is that neurons in the prefrontal cortex reflected category membership, not the exact appearance. So neurons in the prefrontal cortex, unlike places like inferior temporal cortex, neurons in the prefrontal cortex didn't, were insensitive to what, which particular cat or which particular dog the animal, was, the monkey was um, categorizing. All they reflect is which group the, 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 uh, the stimuli belong to, whether they belong to the cat group or dog group. So the neurons threw away information about the details of indiv what individuals look like and pulled out, reflected what was relevant for solving this goal-directed task, the category membership. 
when Andreas Nieder was in the laboratory, he's very interested and still is interested in, in the neural representation of numerosity in the brain. But numerosity is another great example of the brain extracting meaning and throwing away the details of exact physical appearance. So he taught monkeys to recognize the small numbers, uh, one through five, and he displayed these numbers with a variety of different shapes or objects, or and the monkeys were trained to recognize these numbers irrespective of the how they were displayed. And we found in the prefrontal cortex neurons that reflected the number of items in the display, again, irrespective of their exact physical appearance. And on an even higher level, when Joni Wallace and Kathy Anderson or Mat Muhammad were in the lab, uh, they trained monkeys to switch back and forth between two different rules. Uh, rules uh, of match versus non-match. The monkey saw a sample picture, then after a memory delay had to choose between two alternative pictures. Uh, if the monk, and we randomly cued the animal from trial to trial to either choose the same picture, match the original picture, or choose the picture that's different, not match the picture. And when they recorded in the prefrontal cortex, lots of neurons in the prefrontal cortex were reflected which rule the animal was, was um, following on that task. Did it care what pictures the animal was, was uh, holding in working memory? There were some neurons in the prefrontal cortex that did maintain the, the pictures in working memory, but the bulk of neurons in the prefrontal cortex reflected these abstract match, non-match, or choose same versus choose different rules. Okay, so we... In a, in a number of studies, including more I'll tell you about later, we found this that the prefrontal cortex does indeed boil away. It's, the prefrontal cortex reflects this, seems to be the apex of this cortical process where there's a boiling away of irrelevant details. Details are not important for the task at hand and leaving behind the representation of the essence of the task demand. But when we did these studies, we, um, we found something curious, at least at first, it seemed curious 20, 25 years ago. Um, unlike the days of single neuron recording, we recorded from arrays of electrodes in the prefrontal cortex. And as a result, we could randomly select neurons for study. We just dropped our electrodes down in the prefrontal cortex and whatever neurons we encountered, we recorded from. And what we found is that we found these kind of effects, whether it's categorizing cats and dogs or numbers or um, which rule the monkey was following, we found these effects in 30 to 40% of randomly selected neurons. Now, some of you younger people may be uh, too young to, rem to remember that back in the day, back in the 20th century, it used to be thought that individual neurons had specific functions. Every neuron had one function and that neuron just did that one function. And you build a brain by connecting all these individual parts into a giant network. So the fact that we found so many neurons in the prefrontal cortex that showed this property that, that we just um, train the animal to, uh, to uh, train the, on the task that we train the animal to perform was a bit of a, it, did, it sort of flew in the face of that because how could, the, how could this be? How could there be so many neurons dedicated to this task we happen to train the animal on? So what were the explanations? One explanation that was suggested to us was that the task information is overrepresented as a result of training. These animals are spending day in, day out for months training on these tasks, and maybe the task has just taken over the monkey's, monkey's prefrontal cortex. I never thought that was a likely explanation because our monkeys are, have months of experience on these tasks, but humans have years and years of experience. We often do the same thing for, or similar things for decades in a row. So the kind of experience that we carry around in our head uh, is much greater than, than, than the um, training it took to, to get the monkeys to perform these tasks. Another possibility sarcastically suggested, suggested to me when I first started presenting this work is that, mate, what are you saying? The monkey can learn two or three things and their brains would fill up? Um, another thing that suggested was suggested is that maybe we just weren't clever enough to figure out what these neurons were doing. Well, okay, fair enough. So we did more work, more work we did. We did um, a variety of, uh, um, we sallied forth with our, with our uh, investigation, did more work. We kept coming up with this answer over and over again. And other people started addressing this too. And we found that this is actually kind of true. Not only were so many neurons in the prefrontal cortex engaged in these particular top-down demands, but often these neurons showed what seemed to be a multitasking. They 
if you train monkeys to perform more than one task, like two or three tasks in one case, we could see the neurons, the same neuron behaving differently across different tasks, as if the neuron was acting like a different neuron in different contexts. And this led us, and I mean us by first, uh, John Duncan and I first proposed this idea that neurons in the prefrontal cortex and maybe cortex in general are multifunctional. They show adaptive coding or what Stefano Fusi later called mixed selectivity. And this, of course, this is met with a little bit of skepticism at first. John may remember that when we first presented this at a frontal lobe meeting in 2000, we were accused of uh, turning the cortex into a bowl of porridge. But again, you know, we amass more data supporting this and more um, evidence showing that neurons in the prefrontal cortex and other higher order cortical areas really do show multitasking. They show different properties depending on the context in which they're studied, the, the behavioral context. But I think what really nailed this, this concept down for most people was this Stefano Fusi's work um, in collaboration with us on mixed selectivity. What Stefano showed is computationally that this property of mixed selectivity or multifunctionality adds computational horsepower in, in the brain. In fact, what he showed was that you really can't build a brain that could do high order complex tasks without these multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons. Because what they do is they create a high dimensional representational space where a whole bunch of information is intermingling. It provides an extra dimension of representational space so you can solve more complex problems. Uh, it creates greater storage capacity because you know there's a limit to how much information a network of neurons can store because there's gonna be some correlation and activity among, among um, neurons. To put it in a more uh, in a, uh, extreme case, if you had a million neurons all doing the same thing, you might as well have one neuron. But given that there is some correlation in firing patterns in neurons, there's a limit. And what Stefano showed was that if you build a network where every neuron does one thing, like we used to think, you can quickly saturate the network, quickly reach capacity after the network just learned a few tasks. But having these mixed selectivity neurons increases the storage capacity, greatly increases the storage capacity of the network to make it essentially capacity unlimited. And this allows greater flexibility because of all this information intermingling among the same population of neurons in this highly, highly dimensional representational space. It means that arbitrary information can be pulled together and, and uh, um, to form new things like new arbitrary rules, which is something we humans do all the time, and faster learning for the same reason. Now, this mixed selectivity in subsequent work, we found that this mixed selectivity isn't just a property of the prefrontal cortex. We see evidence for it all over cortex. It's more, it reaches its apex in the prefrontal cortex, but we can see this at all, almost every level of cortex, um, even back in, in high order visual cortex. Uh, and if you want to know how the brain creates nice stable representations, because the brain needs to have stable representations to come up with a clear, coherent, um, clear answer. If you want to know how the brain creates these stable representations, given this high dimensional space where all this information is impinging on the same neurons, I point you to recent work by Leo Kotsikoff, a graduate student in my lab, who shows computationally that using known mechanisms that, to, that exist in the brain, things like anti hebbian plasticity and inhibition, you actually, the brain can create these nice stable representations in this high dimensional space. But mixed selectivity um, raises another problem. In addition to us thinking, us being the field, thinking that you, you, we used to think that every neuron had one function, you used to think that, that, that thoughts and actions, volitions, perceptions are all based on a unique ensemble. If you have a unique thought, an image of your, your, uh, your grandmother, um, that means there's a unique collection of neurons that corresponds to that thought, that perception, that memory. But mixed selectivity means that neurons participate in multiple ensembles. And I've illustrated this here. We have two ensembles, one for the purple ensemble for think thought X, and the pink ensemble for think thought y. And what mixed selectivity implies is that you have ensembles stacking on top, stack, stacking on top of ensembles, meaning that many neurons participate, these mixed selectivity neurons participate in multiple ensembles. Well, the other thing we used to think is that anatomy was destiny in the brain. If, uh, if two neurons are connected together and they share a strong synapse, well, if one neuron fires, the other neuron's gonna fire. 
you can throw a few gating mechanisms in there, but that's essentially the way we thought every, everything worked. Well, if this is the case, if, if neurons participate in multiple ensembles and anatomy is destiny, how do you select a single ensemble? If I, if I wanna think X, activate the purple ensemble, well, the anatomical connections will cause activity to run to all the pink ensembles. Pretty soon you have all both ensembles activated simultaneously and you have a, a mishmash, a mush of thoughts. Well, one suggestion for solving this problem is that neural ensembles may be formed by synchronizing brain rhythms. We all know that the brain is highly rhythmic. Uh, it oscillates at frequencies from one hertz to 100 hertz or more. And one possibility proposed by first by Wolf Singer, then carried forward by Pascal Fries, Andreas Engel, and others, including our lab, is that the way you ensembles are formed is you get the constituent neurons for each ensemble to synchronize their rhythms. The idea is that neurons that hum together temporarily wire together. So the purple ensembles formed when the, when the purple neurons all hum together at the same frequency and phase lock together, and they may, maybe the, um, the pink neurons ensemble will hum at a different frequency or they hum out of phase with, with the purple neurons. So you can, by having neurons synchronize their rhythms, you can say this is, a, this is one ensemble and these other neurons that are humming at a different frequency or at a different um, phase synchrony, they're another ensemble. So this allows one ensemble to be selected from overlapping anatomy by, just synch by the synch these synchronized rhythms. And this may endow cognitive flexibility because if you want to change your mind, change your thoughts, learn something new very quickly, you don't have to rewire your brain with every thought. You simply change which these patterns of ensembles, synchrony, by the shifting patterns of resonance, you can quickly change, activate different ensembles and um, have, and have cognitive flexibility. So the way to think about, the way we think about now, the analogy is that anatomy is not destiny in the brain. Anatomy is possibility. Anatomy is the road and highway system. Spikes carrying information are the traffic and these patterns of oscillatory resonance are what directs the traffic. Okay? So when Tim Bushman was in the lab, he's now a, a professor at a Princeton University. When he was in the lab, he decided to look at this directly. And what we did is we trained monkeys to switch back and forth between two rules. Uh, the one rule was pay attention to the color of the stimulus. The other rule was pay attention to the orientation. The monkeys viewed either a vertical bar or a horizontal bar, and the bar was either red or blue. And on different trials, we cued the monkey report the color of the bar or in another trial, we cued the monkey, report the orientation of the bar. And we set these up in opposition so that we were, we were sure the monkey was paying attention to the dimension that we instructed the monkey to pay attention to. So the monkey is randomly cued from trial to trial, pay attention to color, the color rule, or pay attention to orientation, the orientation rule. Then what Tim did is he looked across, looked at LFP synchrony across different recording sites in the prefrontal cortex. And that's what's shown here. Here's a representation of our monkey's prefrontal cortex. This is the arcuate, so this is the lateral prefrontal cortex. It would be right here on my head. This is posterior. So this is, would be the frontal eye fields back here. Here's anterior. The monkey's eye would be here looking forward. And all these circles are different recording sites where we had electrodes um, in the prefrontal cortex, these simultaneous uh, recording electrode arrays. And the colored lines um, connect recording sites whose LFPs showed an increase in synchrony when the monkey was performing the color rule in pink or the orientation rule in blue. Now we looked across, by we, I mean Tim, looked across all frequencies for these effects. And he found that they were limited to the beta band, 12 to 30 hertz. They weren't in lower frequencies and they weren't in higher frequencies, gamma frequencies. They were limited to the beta band. And what he found is there was an increase, a unique pattern of beta LFP synchrony in the prefrontal cortex for one rule versus the other. And you can see that here. There's a lot of overlap. Some recording sites participate in both of these um, neural ensemble, these rhythmic ensembles, but the unique patterns of ensembles for, for each, each rule. So this fits with our idea that, uh, that uh, hypothesis that rhythms, synchronized rhythms help form neural ensembles, a 
color beta rule ensemble versus a orientation beta rule ensemble formed by beta rhythms. And more recently, Dimitris Spinosis, um, who was in the lab recently, but now is at University of College London, he's carrying this work further by, by looking at, at how these networks oscillate together and how we can define networks operationally, ensembles operationally, using things like synchron synchronized rhythms. So once we had that effect in hand, we decided to look for um, more examples of it. And Evan Anzalatis, when he was in the lab, he's now at UC Davis, um, he trained monkeys to um, categorize locations on a computer screen as being up or down. And he varied the exact definition of up and down for trial to trial. So the monkey wasn't simply memorizing places on the computer screen. The monkey was truly doing an up versus down judgment. And what he found is the same effect. He found that there was different patterns of ensembles in beta, different patterns of beta synchrony between LFPs and different recording sites, both within the prefrontal cortex and between the prefrontal cortex and posterior parietal cortex for the different spatial categories. One configuration of beta synchrony for up, another configuration of beta synchrony for down. And this happened both within the prefrontal cortex, within the parietal cortex, and between the two areas. Okay. And we looked back over our old cat and dog shape category data and found the same thing. There was one pattern of beta synchrony, one beta ensemble for cats. And then, then when the monkey was categorizing dog, the ensemble synchrony pattern shifted to another pattern for, for cats. So different beta ensembles for cats versus dogs. And then more, even more recently than that, um, Evan Anzalatis and Andreas Watts, when they are in the lab, they trained uh, monkeys to categorize um, new images each day so we could study this learning process of category learning. And what they did is they used an old um, experimental design from Mike Posner, where they trained monkeys to do dot category categorization. So for every day of recording, we made two arbitrary um, category prototypes formed by these dot patterns constellations, if you will. The monkey never saw the prototypes. What they saw is distortions of the prototypes. We distorted or jittered the dots to create exemplars of the categories. And we trained the monkeys until they could learn new categories within a single three hour recording session. And what we found is these beta ensembles, actually we actually, actually saw them forming as the monkey was learning, learning the category information. So first the monkey's guessing trial and error, and there's no evidence of these unique ensembles for, uh, for one category versus the unique rhythmic ensembles for one category versus the other. But then as the animals acquire the category information, as they begin to really learn the categories, and there was often an aha moment where the monkey suddenly got the category and there was a state change in the monkey's behavior. At that moment, when the monkey acquired the category information, all of a sudden there was this unique ensembles formed in the beta range, beta band for one category versus the other. And that's pretty compelling when you, when you actually see these ensembles forming in, in parallel with the animal's learning of, of top-down information. So with this in mind, let's turn to the title of my talk, which is a uh, working memory. How do you hold thoughts in, in working memory, this men mental sketch pad? Um, for the past 50 years or so, the classic models has been persistent spiking of neurons. Examples from people like Pat Goldman Rakesh's lab, Joaquin Fuster's lab. This is a groundbreaking studies that show that, that when you cue, show the animal a picture or cue it to a spatial location that it has to hold in mind, hold in working memory, what happens is, is that a uh, Neurons are activated by that stimulus. And then when the stimulus goes away and the animal has to hold that stimulus, that picture, that spatial location in working memory, there's elevated activity in places like the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex that seem to maintain that in information in working memory. So here's an example here of is this average spike rate. You show the animal a cue, there's an increase in spike rate. And then over this working memory delay where the monkey's holding the cue in working memory, the activity drops a bit, but it remains above baseline. Once the monkey makes its response and the working memories are no longer relevant, activity drops back down to baseline. So this is a compelling, um, this is a compelling um, model because what it suggests is if you want to hold something in working memory, you activate an ensemble and just keep that ensemble in its active state the whole time you're, uh, you're maintaining in working memory. But um, more recently, since we've um, 
the field has turned around to using multiple electrode technology, there's more random sampling of, of, of neurons and cortex. And what a number of investigators have shown, our laboratory, um, Tanya Pasternak, um, um, Mark Stokes, among others, have shown that in if you look in real time on single trials, and when you're recording from when you have um, data from multiple electrodes, you can do things like look look in real time because you, you can look across different recording sites to average activity uh, in real time rather than having to average activity across multiple trials. If you look on single trials and across the population of these randomly selected neurons, it seems that most neurons in these areas that are supporting working memory, like the prefrontal cortex, don't show what looks like persistent activity. They show sparse and bursty activity. They spike every once in a while and don't show the sustained, the sustained activity. And this led to updates to the classic model. Um, one of the, one of the um, first updates was from Paco Marikish herself, who one of, in one of her last papers um, showed that in the prefrontal cortex, spiking um, induces temporary synaptic weight changes between neurons using these calcium dynamics that last about under one second, the spiking actually temporarily changes synaptic weights and that she proposed that working memory is actually a combination of spiking activity and the synaptic weight changes induced by the spiking. There's also the uh, more recent, the activity silent model of uh, Mark Stokes and the dynamic attractor network model of Michael Lundqvist, which I'll tell you more about because Michael's model, in addition to showing the sparse and how sparse and bursty and synaptic weight changes can maintain working memories, also brings in these oscillatory dynamics. The point of all this is spiking is not doing all the work. It's helped along by temporary impressions, synaptic weight changes that spiking leaves in networks. So spiking is happening every once in a while, and in between bouts of spiking, there's these synaptic weight changes, these impressions that carry the working memory between these bouts of spikings. This saves energy because spikes cost a lot of energy, but it also makes working memories more robust because computational studies have shown that if you just store memories by persistent activity, it's really easy to disrupt those memories. A distraction comes along, you add a second item to working memory, and it changes the original um, dynamics and the, the, it messes up the memory. Um, synaptic weight changes are more, more robust, less, less prone to interference than persistent activity alone. So I'm gonna tell you about the, uh, the model we tested for this. this is a dynamic attractor model of Michael Lundquist, who not only pr proposed this kind of activity silent dynamics with synaptic weight changes, but proposed that um, network dynamics, oscillatory dynamics of two different frequency ranges play an important role. So let me get into that right now. What this shows is this is a test of Michael's uh, um, dynamic attractor model. And what it showed was that sparse, what the model proposed and what we found is that sparse bursty beta gamma dynamics actually underlie working memory. So what I've shown here, this is an um, activity on a single trial from a single electrode in an array. Frequency is on the, um, on the, on the, on the um, Y axis. This is the frequency we're looking at LFPs here. And this is time on the X axis. In this particular experiment, the monkey was asked to hold two pictures in working memory, stimulus one and stimulus two. Here's where we present stimulus one. Here's where we present stimulus two. Here's the working memory delay. And the color shows the power at these different frequency, um, um, different frequency values um, over time. So what we found is that the spikes that during, during, these, during this working memory task, there was these bursts of gamma, brief, brief narrow band bursts of gamma that occurred during stimulus encoding when you present the stimuli and also occurred during the working memory delay. And these bursts of gamma, 30 Hertz and above, 30, about 30 to 100 Hertz, um, these bursts of gamma, they were co-occurring with the bursty spiking that was carrying the working memories. If you look outside, these um, these gamma bursts at spiking, you don't see much information. In some cases, you see no information. So all the spiking that was carrying the information about the working memories, these two stimuli the monkey was holding a working memory, were occurring during these gamma bursts. So we found that spikes carrying working memories are associated in time, co-occurring, riding on top of this these, these brief gamma bursts. And we found, curiously, that beta and gamma were anti-correlated. So I talked about beta before. What we found was that these bursts of gamma that were carrying the spikes 
carrying the working memories were anti-correlated with beta. So whenever beta was bursting, whenever gamma was bursting on the higher frequency, lower frequency beta bursts occurred, but they occurred at times when gamma wasn't bursting. And just to illustrate that, here's the now average across trials. Here's the burst rate across time of the gamma burst shown in um, um, red and the beta burst shown in, 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 in brown. So higher frequency gamma bursts, lower frequency beta bursts. And again, this is over time. So here's the first stimulus presentation. There's a bit of gap there, second stimulus presentation, and here's the working memory delay. And as you can see, beta and gamma are like mirror images of one another. Whenever gamma goes up, beta goes down. Whenever beta goes up, gamma goes down. Notice that gamma goes up during working memory encoding when the stimuli are encoded into working memory, when they're presented here and here. And it ramps up, as is often seen in working memory tasks with spiking, it ramps up over the course of the delay, whereas beta shows the exact opposite. So I said that gamma is associated with the spiking. Gamma is help carrying the working memories. Well, what does beta do, this anti-correlated beta? Well, I hope you remember from just a few minutes ago that what beta does is it carries top-down information. There's unique patterns of beta that can these patterns of beta synchrony are actually carrying top-down information, the rules, the information the monkey is needing to solve the task. So what this suggested to us is that top-down information um, carried by beta rhythms may play, could play an inhibitory role that gates gamma and therefore gates the information, the bottom-up information the monkey's um, carrying a working memory. In other words, that Gamma is carrying the contents of working memory, the actual working memories themselves. And this anti-correlation suggests to us that beta carrying top-down information could be gating gamma. It could have this inhibitory role where if you want to encode information in working memory, you turn down beta, it allows gamma to be expressed, information is encoded in working memory. You want to maintain information in, in, in working memory, you tamp down on beta a bit so, the, so gamma can be a burst can occur and the spikes can occur that, that carry working memories and induce those synaptic weight changes. And if you want to clear out working memory, you simply turn up beta that drives gamma down and that clears out neuron stop spiking and that, that, that clears out working memory. So that's a general idea. Um, and we propose all this and, and uh, uh, detail this in, in this paper that we review we recently published in Neuron. But to carry this further, so this is suggestive. So to carry this further, we looked at data from a um, more complex working memory task where the monkeys were um, uh, making mul holding multiple items in working memory and making multiple decisions. I'm not going to go into detail on, on this uh, study. It's in this paper if you'd like to see it. But what we found that these beta gamma dynamics, the beta gamma balance, had indeed had properties consistent with beta being a control signal that gates and controls the maintenance of information in working memory. The beta gamma dynamics, they gate information into working memory, they clear information out of working memory. So you want to gate information in working memory, you decrease beta, it allows gamma to be expressed, clear information out of working memory, you increase beta increases that tamps down on, on gamma and spiking, working memory is cleared out. And also in this experiment, we had the animals switch back and forth between the, holding one stimulus of working memory and switching to another stimulus. And these same beta gamma dynamics, a rapid cycling them, allow the animal to switch from one, one um, working memory to the other. And as we neurophysiologists often do, we look at the relationship between neural activity and behavior to see if we can see if the, if the behavior can, if the, if the, if the um, neural activity can do things like predicts the animal's errors or predict decisions the monkey made. So this is something neurophysiologists have done for a long time. If you wanna know whether something's functionally relevant, some phenomenon, you see if it goes away, if it's disrupted when the animal makes a mistake. And sure enough, we found that the balance between beta and gamma was actually a better predictor of the animal's decisions and the errors animal, animal would make than spiking activity alone. So wanting to look at this, these beta gamma interactions a little more closely, um, Andre Bassos and Roman Lunas in the lab, they started, they looked at, they looked at the microcircuitry um, that support these beta gamma dynamics. So what they did is they embarked on a series of recordings where they use so-called laminar electrodes. These are laminar, these are electrodes with 
multiple recording contacts along the shaft. And what they allowed us to do is record from all layers of cortex simultaneously. Now, why would we wanna do that? Why, we want to, why are we interested in, in layers? Well, simply because we know from anatomy that the superficial layers of cortex, layers one through three, uh, and a bit of four, the superficial layers of cortex are the feed forward layers of cortex that carry information, carry bottom up information from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Whereas the deep layers of cortex, they have anatomy consistent with feedback. They carry, top, they, they carry feedback information, presumably top down signals from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. So naturally you wanted to see if these dynamics would play across these different cortical layers. And that's exactly what we found. So the first thing they found was that the working memory spiking, the spiking carrying the working memories was um, stronger in the superficial layers of cortex and deep layers of cortex. So here on the y-axis the, is the cortical layer with layer four or the input layer of cortex, uh, the middle layer shown by the dotted line. And here's the multi, in color is the multi-unit activity. This is spiking activity now during this working memory task. The monkey saw a cue, here's the working memory delay. And as you can see, the spikes carrying the working memory were stronger in the superficial layers of cortex. That makes sense because again, the superficial layers are the feed forward layers that carry bottom up information. We showed the animal a picture, bottom up information. It makes sense that the superficial layers of cortex, the feed forward layers would hold on to this bottom up information. Then when we looked at the relative power, now again, here's the layer along the Y axis, but now we're looking at the relative power of both beta in red and gamma in blue in the superficial versus deep layers of cortex as a function of cortical layers. And what we found is that gamma was stronger in the superficial layers of cortex. Again, that makes sense. The superficial layers are the feed forward layers. They're the bottom up layers. I mentioned that gamma is associated with holding bottom up information in working memory. So it makes sense that gamma should be stronger in the superficial layers. Beta was stronger in the, in the deep layers of cortex. And that makes sense because again, the deep layers are, are, the, are the feedback layers of cortex that we, and we propose that beta is carrying top down information from the front of the brain to the, to the rest of cortex. So it makes sense that beta would be in the deep, there'd be stronger beta in the deep feed, feedback layers of cortex. And then these beta and gamma dynamics where these anti-correlation between beta and gamma actually played a played across these levels of cortex. So this is the um, now a power correlation between power in, in beta and power in gamma um, with the layer providing beta, either the superficial layer or deep layer on the, on the x-axis and the layer providing gamma deep versus superficial on the y-axis. And what these colors just simply show is that these beta gamma dynamics um, um, at the correlation occur across the deep and superficial layers of cortex. If beta is high in deep layer cortex, gamma is low in superficial layer cortex. If gamma is high in superficial layer cortex, beta is low in deep layer cortex. So that suggests this model where the, where the uh, beta is carrying top-down information uh, from the front of the brain to the back of the brain and the deep feedback layers of cortex. And they have this inhibitory or gating role on the gamma Carry and spiking, carrying bottom-up information in the feed-forward direction in the superficial layers of cortex. So it works like this. The idea that top-down information carry is carried by deep layer beta. And we found through things like Granger's causality, measures of, of LFPs and power between the superficial and deep layers, that what deep layer beta is doing, it's regulating the weaker superficial um, layer beta. So the, the deep layer, strong deep layer beta is regulating the expression of superficial layer beta. And superficial layer beta in turn regulates, inhibits gamma and spiking, allowing um, control over working memory storage. Okay, so that's, that's the basic model. It's a, it's a circuit for top-down control over, over working memory. But once we um, had these uh, data in uh, mind, we then we thought, well, why should it be just working memory and frontal cortex? These sort of beta gamma dynamics are evident all over cortex. You see it in motor cortex when people are inhibiting or animals are inhibiting motor responses. There's a lot of beta as the, as the motor response is being inhibited. And the moment they're given a go signal, beta drops and gamma increases, spiking increases, and the animal makes its response. So what we did is we looked across um, 
recordings, simultaneous recordings from frontal, parietal, and visual cortex. This is a recent um, study from um, Michael Lundqvist in the lab. And what Michael found was that everywhere we looked in cortex, whether it's frontal, parietal, or visual cortex, we found these same dynamics, the same push-pull relationship between deep layer beta and superficial layer gamma. Uh, so this suggested the similar mechanisms that are at play all over cortex. And just to mention this, um, we found another interesting thing is that um, all, it, across all bands, fr LFP um, frequency power actually increases slightly as you go from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. So gamma power in, uh, increases in frequency as you move forward. And in visual cortex, what's alpha in visual cortex becomes beta as you gradually move forward to frontal cortex. And I mentioned that because alpha in visual cortex has been associated with volitional control of attention. So it seems that the same that what beta does in frontal cortex is the same thing that alpha does in visual cortex. In fact, it's the same thing and it's along a continuum. So now I'm not just gonna be talking about beta, I'll talk about the combined um, alpha and beta frequency band as a top-down control mechanism um, and whether it's more alpha, or more beta depends on where you are in cortex. So we thought, well, if this is working all over all over cortex, then it might play a role in something that's ubiquitous to cortex, some fundamental function of, of um, cortex, which is predictive coding. Predictive coding is the brain constantly makes mental models of the environment. The brain's constantly anticipating what sensory inputs are going to be coming in the next second or so. This generates again, ongoing predictions of forthcoming uh, sensory inputs. And this allows the brain to suppress full processing of predicted inputs. The brain doesn't need to process predicted inputs because predicted inputs, because they're predicted, are by definition not very informative. And your brain can't process every sensory input coming into it, into the brain, because it would be quickly be overwhelmed. And then unexpected input prediction errors, things that weren't predicted are fed forward to update the mental model. Because they weren't predicted, these unexpected inputs, they by definition are informative. So there's a lot of behavioral evidence behind predictive coding, um, but how it's implemented in the brain is less clear. Many models use specialized prediction circuits where at every level of cortical processing, there's these specialized circuits that look for this mismatch between prediction and input or look for what's called these prediction errors and then pass it forward um, for, the, for the next level of processing. That's possible, but we think there may be a more parsimonious explanation. Namely that alpha, beta, and gamma rhythms can support predictive coding in, in the same way they can support working memory storage in a similar fashion. Namely, that predictions, alpha, beta, carries predictions from higher order cortex down the lower cortex. And these alpha, beta rhythms inhibit the gamma spiking in pathways that process the predicted sensory inputs. In other words, these alpha, beta dynamics are targeting the representations back in sensory cortex that would process the predicted input when that input appears. And then by inhibiting them, they prevent those um, um, stimuli, those predicted inputs to be fully processed. And that means prediction errors are simply the gamma and spiking that occurs in pathways, sensory cortical pathways that are unaffected by these alpha beta um, prediction signals, these feedback prediction signals. So you don't need specialized circuits to detect this mismatch. All you need to do is inhibit the pathways with alpha beta that would process a predicted stimulus. And every unaffected pathway is by definition a pathway that feeds forward a prediction error. Okay. So we tested this in a, in a recent paper just appeared last week in a PNAS uh, work in collaboration with uh, Nancy Capel's lab, where we recorded from laminar recordings in, um, in all these different areas and, and prefrontal cortex, frontal eye fields, parietal cortex, um, area V4. And we used a task where the monkey was doing delayed match to sample. So we knew the monkey was always engaging with the stimulus, but we had the animal perform this task in two different blocks of trials. In one block of trial, the sample stimulus was always the same for 50 trials. It was totally predictable. Then another block of trials, there was three sample stimuli possible, but they were chosen randomly from trial to trial. So these sample stimulus was, was unpredictable. So we had these two states, the monkey's performing this task with a predictable sample object or doing a block of trials or it's performing the same task with unpredictable sample objects. 
And what we found is, is evidence consistent with the role of these beta, alpha, beta, and gamma dynamics um, playing a role in predictive coding. We found there was increased inter-area gamma coherence and power to unpredictable sample objects. And on the opposite side, conversely, we found increased eta, alpha, beta coherence and power to predictable objects. So what's shown here to, for illustrative purposes is the coherence between LFPs in the frontal eye fields and area V4. And we've, we've, we've taken the LFP coherence to unpredictable stimuli and subtracted the um, coherence to predictable stimuli from it. So the way to read this is on the y-axis, this is higher coherence when the sample object was unpredictable, when it was by definition a prediction error. And down on the bottom half of the graph, that's more coherence when the object was completely predictable. And what we found is shown here, we could see that there's an increase in gamma um, band coherence between um, frontal eye fields and area V4 when, whenever the monkey was viewing uh, and holding in, in working memory an unpredictable object. And there was an increase in alpha beta coherence in the opposite situation where the monkey was viewing and holding in working memory a predictable object. I've also, also you see an effect of theta here. What often happens in cortex is um, in cortex, theta is weaker than it is in the hippocampus. So you don't often see theta. And when you see, do see theta, it tends to co-track with gamma. For instance, even if you don't see theta, gamma bursts tend to wax and wane with, uh, in, in, um, in, in, in theta periods. So there's some cross-frequency coupling between theta and gamma. So it seems like theta and gamma are both playing a role in the contents of thoughts, whereas this band in between alpha beta is playing the control um, signal role, controlling uh, um, processing of um, not only what you hold in working memory, but also um, uh, gating um, the processing of bomb up information in cortex. So this is just between frontal, this is for illustrate purposes, the, the results we found between V4 and, and frontal eye fields, visual cortex and frontal cortex, the same dynamics played out all over cortex. So now here's all the areas. Here's our parietal cortex areas here. Here's our frontal cortex areas. This is visual cortex. Here's the four different frequency bands from theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, the thickness of the line illustrates um, the degree of coherence between the areas, or in the case of the boxes, the degree of co coherence within, within the area. And the color of the line shows whether there was more coherence when the, when, um, when the stimuli, when the sample object was unpredictable, shown in red, or predictable, shown in blue. And you can see that both, both for both gamma and theta, um, they um, generally, they're, they're more, there's more coherence in gamma and theta for unpredictable objects. Whereas in the alpha-beta range, there's more alpha-beta coherence both within areas and across areas um, when the objects were, were um, predictable, supporting the idea that alpha-beta is carrying the predictions and gamma is carrying, helping carry the, the prediction errors, the feed-forward signals of, um, for unpredictable objects. Now, I'll mention that parietal area 7A was an exception to, to this rule. And that actually made sense because Nancy Capel's lab has shown that um, um, high alpha, low beta rhythms in, in area 7A in particular in her, in her models may have a particular role in updating um, um, work, the contents of working memory. But two things noteworthy here is that and not only were these network dynamics consistent with this idea that alpha beta is carrying predictions and gamma is carrying the unpredicted um, prediction errors, the feed forward uh, prediction errors, is that gamma coherence was stronger in the feed forward direction from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, as, you, as one might expect if this model was true. And the alpha beta coherence was stronger in the feedback direction from prefrontal cortex back to the rest of the brain. And importantly, these effects were stimulus specific. These effects were strongest, the changes in power in alpha, beta and coherence, uh, alpha, beta and gamma power and coherence, they were strongest at the recording sites in sensory, corte in sensory cortex where spiking preferred that particular, that specific unpredicted or predicted stimulus. So, so this isn't a general, these alpha, beta control signals and gamma dynamics aren't just 
generally turning on and off processing, they can target representations of specific stimuli, which is what you need if they're going to play a role in, um, in predictive coding. So I see I'm running out of time. One last thing I was going to tell you about was some unpublished um, data, um, which I'll say for another time. But just to give you a 10 second summary, um, the brain is highly lateralized and even working memories, if you present on one side of vision, working memories are stored in, in one side of the brain or the other side of the brain. We did this recent experiment that we're now um, preparing for publication. Uh, where we used a behavioral trick to get the animal to move the working memories back and forth between the two different um, hemispheres, between the right and left hemispheres. And the same beta gamma dynamics were involved when the working memories were transferred between the right and left brains. So skipping ahead that for another time, maybe. I'll just get to my summary. We, across all these studies, we find that uh, um, alpha beta is like a control signal that feeds back top-down information through cortex. It regulates the expression of gamma that traffics bottom-up sensory information, in other words, the contents. And we think of this as a modal cortical circuit that plays a role in top-down control of cortical processing in general, not just control of working memory, but control of attention, uh, predictive coding, and even in our recent study, even the transfer of information um, between the cerebral hemispheres when that when that needs to be done in, in the context of a, of a goal-directed task. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have.